Amen. Good morning, saints of God. It's good to see all of you this morning, and it's good to see all of those of you who may be with us for the very first time. We're so glad that you came, and so we want to welcome all of you, whether you're here at Burkhart or wherever you're watching this. We're so glad you're a part. Matter of fact, ladies at DCI, we love you today. Come on, make them feel real welcome. We love you. And and if you're here for the very first time, we want to welcome you and let you know we've been praying for you before you even got here. And we have a gift for you, actually, before you leave. And so you can avail yourself of that right back at the Next Step Center. It's just our way of saying thank you for coming and worshiping the Son of God with us. And so uh, we're glad you're here. Come on, everyone. Make them feel real welcome. Can we do that? <laughs> Amen. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. And now this morning, I, I, I have a, a message that... that um, it, it, it is bathed in the love of God. Now, it's at war with the culture that we live in, but it loves you. Amen? So today I, I, I'm going to minister this message. And the reason why I'm ministering this message is because the time of the year. I'm always reminded in September and October about the festivals of the Lord that happened during this time. And they have New Testament relevance, especially to the timing, I believe, of prophetic fulfillment. Uh, during our time, and I'm going to share some things with you that, that may say, wow, get your rapture clothes on, get your gym shoes on, get out in the front yard and start doing rapture drills, because Jesus is coming. And I'll give you more of those specific kinds of things next week, but this week, I, I just want to remind you that the 25th through the 27th of September starts what's called the Feast of Trumpets. Come on, blow a trumpet in Zion, Zion. Y'all remember that? Okay, all right. That's only a few of us older folks. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sakat, which is October 9 through 16. And so all of those things are relevant. You say, I don't even, are you speaking in tongues, Pastor? I don't understand what you just said. It is, it is the, the Feast of the Tabernacles fulfilled in Jesus. And... And so the question, there's two questions I want to ask you today for the message. And the two questions, and hopefully I can come up with, a, with the right answer for you. But knowing that you're loved of God, God wants you to know the time that you're living in. Because it's not just any old time. You showed up in what I call the last days. I'll describe that here in just a moment. But there's two questions I want to ask. And the first one is, are we living in the last days? The answer to that is obviously what I just said. It's yes, we are living in the last days. Matter of fact, you can find in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, you can find all kinds of, of different prophetic fulfillment that's going on right now across this planet, some of which it was impossible to even know that it's going on unless it was in this day, in this age with satellite and the ability to know what's going on on the other side of the planet at the same time you're living in. And so it's important for us to get this. Now, there's two major events that says this generation shall not pass away until all is fulfilled. And that's, that's found in uh, Luke 21 where the Bible says that the nation of Israel, or the olive tree, buds, or when Israel becomes a nation again, 1948 is when that took place, that generation won't pass till all is fulfilled. So 1948 has been a while ago. And so here we are. And then uh, Luke chapter number 21 verse 24 says that when Jerusalem is won back, when it's restored, when the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, and that's Jerusalem one back, 1967, again, that generation shall not tap, pass away until all is fulfilled. And so you'll find a great deal of the signs, some of which are relevant to the second coming, not the rapture. Rapture seven years before the, the second coming. There's a time of tribulation, or Daniel's 70th week, if you will, that are going to be fulfilled. And so Jesus came... Daniel prophesied that Jesus would come, and he came, but he didn't come in the 770s or 77s. He didn't come in 490 years. He came in, in uh, 400 and, and what's the number? 83 years. So is, there's seven years left of Old Testament time that God talked about in the book of Daniel. We'll talk about it maybe next week. Maybe. We'll see. Because there's so much content to cover relative to current events that's actually being fulfilled. And it's what the Scripture said thousands of years ago. And it was impossible to even know it until now. And now we know. And I'm going to show you some things that will excite you. Hopefully I'm going to be able to share some things that will make us all reevaluate 
our lives because the Bible says in 1 John, as you see the day of the Lord approaching, purify yourself. In other words, there's a reason that I'm wanting to live clean. Jesus is about to come. Amen. And so, again, more next week, but the point I want to share with you is you don't sleep through a move of God. Is it possible to sleep through a move of God? Yep. Look at your neighbor and say, yep. yep. It's possible. And I'm going to show you one instance in Luke chapter 9. If you have your Bibles with you, you can look at Luke chapter number 9. I'll start reading with verse number 28. Jesus is taking three of his disciples up on a mountain to pray. And it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. You'll understand that here in just a moment. But he's taking Peter, James, and John, which, by the way, probably had some serious uh, celebration in it and maybe even being felt left out by the other disciples that weren't invited. But Peter, James, and John, they get invited up on the mountain to pray. Woo-hoo, big deal. Well, that wears off fairly quickly. I'll, I'll read it to you and you'll understand. And the, the word says, Now it came to pass about the eighth day after these sayings that he took Peter and John and James, and he went up onto the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became as white and glistening. And behold, two men walked, it, walked up to him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in the glory and spoke of his decease, or the fact that he would be crucified, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And so here's Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. I mean, who ministers to Jesus? Well, bring Moses and Elijah back. And so they ministered to him about what he was about to experience in crucifixion and paying for the sins of humanity. And so verse 32 says, Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Okay, how do you sleep through this? Jesus is lit up like a light bulb. And these guys are sleeping through the experience. And so they were, they were sleepy. They had fallen asleep. And so, and so when they saw the glory of God and the two men that stood with him, and then it, it happened that as they were parting from Jesus, from talking to him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Come on, how many of you think that's an understatement? Well, what do you say when you're freaking out watching people glow? I don't know. That, maybe you say that. Master, it's good that we be here. Let's build three tabernacles. Religious response to a glorious experience. Let me say it again. A religious response to a glorious experience. In other words, this is so cool. Let's just stay here every day and make this happen over and over and over again. Sounds just like church folk. I'm experiencing something new. I don't know what it's for, but it's so cool. I just want it to happen again and again and again and again. Let's build our tabernacle here. Sound like church folks. Because what God does here isn't about here. What God does here is about out there. He said, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, and while he was saying this, a cloud came up. Boom, 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 boom. A cloud came, and it overshadowed. Say the word overshadowed. overshadowed. It'll be relevant in a minute. Overshadowed them, and they were fearful And as they entered into the cloud, and the voice came out of the cloud. It's God, the Father. He says, this is my beloved Son. And listen to his instruction. Don't build tabernacles. Hear him. That's what this is about, hearing him. These three disciples were called, and they were called to the mountain with Jesus on assignment to pray. Now, they weren't praying. They were sleeping, but they were there. They were called to pray, and they were in the right location. They just weren't getting the point. And the glory of the Lord transforms the appearance of Jesus, and he glows like a light bulb, which has got to be absolutely spectacular. I mean, think about it. Everything, as Pastor Joel preached a couple of weeks ago, that everything associated with light was associated with fire. And now Jesus is lit up like the sun. I mean, he's glistening, and it's not kind of an, a yellow, sort of a fiery glow. It's the glory of God. I mean, white light for the first time in their lives. And they're seeing it, and Jesus is lit up like, you know, LEDs. Hello? His clothes is now glistening. Pretty cool. And so they're hearing the experience, but the disciples at the same time are heavy with sleep, the Bible says. And they woke up when they were fully awake, they saw the glory. Let me say it again. They woke up and 
they saw the glory of God. When they were fully awake, man, I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of folks these days that are sleeping through a move of God. Don't even know what's going on. I'm going to tell you about it here in just a minute. But you, are you in a move of God right now? Say, I'm praying for one, Pastor Brad. I'm just praying, praying and praying. I'm going to tell you statistics of what's going on on the planet right now in everywhere but America so the church can wake up and see the glory of God. See, I wouldn't have possible, I wouldn't think it was possible to sleep through the glory of God had I not read this story. Evidently, it is possible that you can be called to pray and in the right location and miss the reason for the meeting. And when they were fully awake, the Bible says they began to understand Jesus in a brand new dimension. How many of you think this was a serious opportunity for a faith upgrade? Hello? Like he walks on water and multiplies lunches, raises the dead, but this is a brand new dimension of where I thought he could go. He glows now. Hello? This would be, a, and it would also kick in the imagination that if this is possible, what else is possible? Because no one else on the planet has seen this kind of glory before. And so their imagination, boing, begins to peg and, and understand it, it's, a, it's a magnificent experience. No doubt their faith and imagination went to a brand new level when Jesus lit up. But it's possible, even with this glorious experience, to have a misguided response to this glorious manifestation. Building tabernacles. And so the Father shows up to interpret what they're experiencing. Now, the, maybe at least as great of an experience as what they've seen in Jesus lighten up is God the Father speaking to them out of a glory cloud. Magnificent moment number two. The Bible says he overshadowed them. This is my beloved son, and this is what he said, hear him, hear him. All right, now I'm going to explain that in just a moment because there's some, some insight in the original language. But the word overshadow is the Greek word because the New Testament's written in Greek, the Old and Hebrew, and they spoke in Aramaic. Kind of, kind of confusing, but here, we go, here you go. But, but the word overshadow is also in your Bible in Luke chapter number 1 where Mary experiences Gabriel, the archangel, who comes down and says that you're going to be, you're going to be pregnant with the divine Son of God. You're calling, going to call his name Jesus. She says, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And he said, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Episkiazo, same word. And that which is born in you will be called the Son of God. And so that was Mary's experience. And so the... She, she, she said, be it unto me according to your word. And so that's, that's the faith response to what was happening to her. Hopefully the same response is supposed to happen to Peter, James, and John. It took a while, but they, they stumbled around for a while. They eventually got it. But understand, when, when God says, hear him, the Amplified Bible actually captures the, the, the meaning of hearing him. It's got to be birthed in you. It's got to be episkiazoed on the inside of each one of us. It needs to come alive like Jesus came alive in Mary. It needs to come alive in each one of us because you're living in a day when you, you can't fool around with just religious philosophy, which is kind of where we've landed in denominations all over the planet, especially in the United States. That's the reason why they're dying. So it's, 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 so it's important to, to get this. It's, it, he, the word that he uses here to hear him, the Amplified Bible says it this way. This is my beloved son, my chosen one. Listen, obey, and yield to him. Listen, obey, and yield to him. That's one Greek word used here for the word hear him. Hear him. It means to listen, yield, and obey. And so it's important for us to really grab a hold of that. When God says, here's my beloved son, don't just hear him. In other words, don't just log it into your memory banks. This is what Jesus said. You want me to tell you what he said? I'll tell you what he said. And never do anything about it. He said, no, 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 no. Listen to what he said and then yield to him and obey and do what he said. It's not just knowing what he said. It's doing what he said. And that's what he was telling these guys. So the original language captures that. You say, hear him? Say, okay, I heard him. No, you didn't really hear him like God says unless you listen, yield, and obey. And that's kind of the point, isn't it? Don't build tabernacles. Keep moving. Listen, yield, and obey. Listen, you try it. Listen. 
And that's what God wants for each one of us. In other words, the fruit of Christianity is something that's observable because we listen, yield, and obey. Not because we go to a building on a Sunday morning, but we actually do what's said in the building. Wouldn't that be a novel idea? James had a lot to say about being a doer of the word, not just hearer only, deceiving yourselves. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the, the, to cap off the whole Sermon on the Mount, says, if you hear these things that, that you hear me say and you put them into practice, you're like a man that built his house upon a rock and the storms come against that house, but the house stands through, the, through it all because it's founded on the rock. But he that hears these things of mine and doesn't put them into practice, like a guy that built his house, heard the same sermon, but built his house on the wrong foundation. Because, and the foundation is determined by whether you do what you heard. It's not whether you heard it, it's whether you did something with what you heard. He said, because then the wind comes, the storm blows and beats on that house as well, but the house falls, and great is the fall of it. And so I don't want to build on shifting sand, and I don't want to pastor a church that's on that sand either. Amen. I need a good amen. amen. Come on, you hear me back in the cheap seats back there, y'all all right? So it's possible to sleep through a move of God. So number one, don't sleep through the move of God. Because it's possible for you to think by going to church, it means a great deal more than just going anywhere else. Because you can get a lot of real impactful things, I believe, at church, not only from the community of faith, but the messages that you hear and the community that's built to help you make you really strong in the Lord. The entire design of Living Word Church is not just to have a place to go on Sunday, but to build a community that's strong in the world you have to live in. And so that, that's, that's the point for us. It's not just, I mean, you can look strong here and be a wimp out there. Come on, how many of you know nobody wants that? Right? right? No. Raise your right hand. <laughs> I don't want that. So, so number one, you can sleep through a move of God. Don't do it. Don't respond to a move of God religiously. Number two. Number three is three points. Listen, yield, and obey. Again, number one, don't sleep through a move of God. Secondly, don't respond religiously to a move of God. And number three, listen, yield, and get busy. And so there must be an awakening that takes place. In other words, an appropriate action when the Father said, hear him, take action on what you're hearing him say. Listen, this is my son. Listen to what he says and do what he says. So you have a God encounter, but it's going to send you into a course of action. So this glorious experience is not about the experience itself. This glorious experience of transfiguration is about to change and transform the disciples that were experiencing it. Their imagination, their faith going to a brand new level, coming down ready to experience the, the meaning, the impact, the power of what happened to them up on the mountain with Jesus. And so what's the point? The point is wake up like the disciples had to wake up to the glory of God. Wake up, steward the experience that you've been given. How many of you thank God for whoever it was that was bold enough, could have been your parents, could have been a TV evangelist, it could have been somebody just passing out tracts on the street. How many of you thank God somebody shared the living message of a living Christ with you? Amen? Not the old dead dried up stuff. I'm talking about the real story of the Son of God. That He's alive and well and wants to do life with you. Life transforming. And so I'm going to tell you and show you more in detail next week, but, but this week I'm going to share with you that you're in a move of God. Amen. Maybe the greatest that the world's ever seen. Say, I ain't heard nothing about that there, Pastor. That's because you're in one of the spots that ain't happening. Hmm. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus speaking, he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world. Say whole world. Whole world. As a testimony to all nations. The word nations is the word ethnos. We get the word ethnic from, it, from that Greek word. We get it, the word ethnic or ethnic groups from it. And then will the, this is the point, then will the end come. Once the gospel gets to every people group, by the way, there's 7,000 different people groups. There's only 193 sovereign nations, but there's 7,000 ethnic groups within those boundaries. And so Jesus didn't, wasn't talking about lines on a map. He was talking about every people group getting infused with the gospel. And so, again, they, 
there, there has never been a generation like the one that you and I are living in, like never. That, that we are seeing more people on the planet today, N not, not in the days to come. I'm talking about right now. You're seeing more people come to Jesus across this planet than ever in history. Now let me describe. In the last 50 years, 50, there have been more people come to Jesus in the last 50 years than in the previous 1970 years. Combined. 1970, there was estimated to be 1.2 billion Christians on the planet. 2020, 2.7 billion on the planet. More than double in the last 50 years. And so understand today, primarily in, in places where the gospel is, is exploding like this, is in places where it's been seriously needed in, in nations that it's unfriendly to be a Christian, may, mostly Muslim nations of the world and, and other religions and so forth where Christianity has kind of been pushed out. I, it is exploding fast. The church is growing in these places faster than population growth on the planet. And so it's, it's, God is moving across the planet with people that are very courageous, not overqualified, not seminary graduates, just people that know the story and are telling it, and God's doing miracles right behind them. Amen. Tell you a couple of stories that just blow, the, blow your hair back. But it's just amazing. And, and one of the other characteristics that's happening right now, since we built Dream Center and we, we have a real heart for this at Living Word, it probably is real relevant for all of us because poverty is falling dramatically in the places where the gospel is gone. I'll give you the statistics. Here we go. 1990, 52% of the planet's population was living in what's deemed or called extreme poverty, under a dollar a day. So if it's under a dollar a day, and it could be nothing during the course of a day, but the value of a dollar a day, 52% in 1990 lived in extreme poverty. By, and, and as this thing continue, continues to explode and the gospel expand, in 2017, that number from, went from 52 to 16%. Yeah. Wow. 2022, 9.2% in extreme poverty. Now, nobody, we don't want people to be in extreme poverty ever, anywhere. But what I'm showing you is, and almost 100% of the time where this poverty was is where the gospel is now being preached and, and people were coming to church literally by the millions. It's happening right now. Are we in the last days? Don't miss next week. Second marvelous question, number two. Are we living in the last days of the first one? The answer is yes. Number two, what is the appropriate action per what we just read out of Luke 9? What's the appropriate action to take if, in fact, we're in the last days? I can just tell you right now, it's not buy tribulation food and go buy a bomb shelter. That's not the proper response. What is the proper response? See, the Bible has all kinds of appropriate responses for us, and it doesn't have anything to do with freeze-dried food. Romans chapter number 13. You got your Bibles? Look at Romans 13. Paul gives us some serious impart, he imparts to a serious revelation, and, and it starts with the love of God. That the love of God is, is something that is the centerpiece of every believer. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. He said that in chapter 5. That the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and that love is the fulfilling of the law of God. And so, Ten Commandments, if you walk in love... Thou shalt not kill is carried. It, it kind of, it's, yeah, if you love somebody, you're not going to kill them. not going to steal from them either. They're not going to sleep with their wife. Somebody give me a good amen. 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 So the love of God, the Bible says, is the fulfilling of a law, the, the great law of God. And so Romans 13, I'm going to start reading with verse number 10, and this is what it says, Romans 13, 10. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Verse 11. Couched in the love of God, he says... And do this knowing the time. Say, knowing the time. knowing the time. So love your neighbor. In other words, that's the appropriate response in the time that you're in. Okay, not, not be hateful. Come on, we're living in a time where if you disagree with somebody, you just not have a different opinion. 
you're my enemy and I hate you. And that's the temperature. If I have a different opinion, you're a hater. Really? Just because I don't agree? It's kind of like looking at, across your table at your kids and saying, you don't like broccoli? I hate you! <laughs> what? It's just as illogical and stupid. But it is a, listen, it's a sign of the time you're in. Walk in the love of God knowing the time that it is high time to awake out of sleep. Come on, somebody. Can you sleep through a move of God? Luke 9 proves you can move, while Jesus is lit up like a light bulb, you can sleep through it. He said, awake uh, out of your sleep for the day of our salvation. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In other words, salvation, that is the culmination of these things. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore. Anytime you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. Knowing the time that you're in, here's the response. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Don't call it grace and keep doing it. Don't call it grace and keep doing it. Cast off the unfruitful works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, which means there is an improperly. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, that is wild partying, if you will, and drunkenness. Well, pastor, you're just a real killjoy. I didn't write this. I want to go to that college because they have wild parties there. You need to read Ephesians chapter number 5 and walk properly. Walk as in the light and not in darkness. Somebody say, well, I, I think it's okay. Well, what scripture you got for that? What did Jesus say about it? Come on, somebody. I don't know what book some people read. But here's what he says. In the context of walking in love, love for God and love for your neighbor, wake up and know what time you're living in and act appropriately. That's what he said so far. He said, don't do it in, in wild partying, in drunkenness, or in lewdness, or in lust, which means sec sexual promiscuity or immoral living. Not in strife or in envy. Man, I mean, come on. Super Bowl commercials pay like $3 million for 30 seconds to create envy. Hello? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Let me just, and let me say this about your bodies. Your body is a gift from God, so treat it well. You only got one. Are you with me? And it's to carry you around the planet to do the will of God. The problem with your body is occasionally when it wants to get in charge, it's not really good at leading you in the right direction. And so don't, your flesh is cherished, but don't let your flesh be the leader. It's a great follower. It's a terrible leader. And so what is, the, what is the takeaway from Ephesians 5, this passage that we've read? Number one, love knowing the time you're in. How many of you have children? Lift your hands, wave them at me. Amen. How many of you have children? Your children are being born into an age that is post-Christian, post-modern living is post-Christian. In other words, they may not know what the name of Jesus even means. They may have heard it, maybe not, in great segments of the population. Of Generation Z, 98% of Generation Z are not in church. 98%. That means, how can you call a church successful in its mission when you miss 98% of your potential? That's what's happening right now. Post-Christian, post-modernism is the creating the atmosphere of what used to be demonstratively Christian and Bible-based. Matter of fact, you couldn't even graduate from law school in the United States without having a Bible because every law of, of Blackstone's commentary on law, you couldn't even graduate from law school unless you had a Bible. You didn't even know what the laws meant because they were written with chapter and verse next to them. Every one of them. One of the greatest revivalists of the, of the Second Great Awakening got saved in law school reading a law book because 
that it had so penetrated the culture. It didn't make America perfect. No nation is perfect. Until there's a new heaven and a new earth, it's never going to be. But understand today, the reason why America is blessed is because of its foundation. And now, post, post-World War II, 61% of the society, 61% was in church regularly after World War II. Of the emerging generation, it's 2%. And it's important to know that. Why? Because you are, you are at the cusp of, at the verge of, one of the greatest awakenings that the world has ever experienced. What God said, awake out of sleep and arise from the dead and Christ will give you light, is Ephesians 5. Christ will give you light if you'll just wake up. The glory of God's manifesting and half of the world is getting saved. All except 17 nations of the world are either in decline spiritually or stagnant spiritually, and the United States is stagnant, going nowhere at this point. I believe there's an awakening coming. Yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you why. Because your pastor is bold enough to tell you that there's a consequence for doing it wrong. You can miss the glory of God by doing it wrong. See, I don't believe any of that stuff's coming. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen right in front of you, though. I don't think Jesus is coming. Well, I don't think it's going to stop him anyway. So love, knowing the time you're in, wake up. Jesus is coming. Cast off the darkness. Number three, cast off the darkness. And number four, put on the armor of light. And I think it's interesting. He didn't just say put on light or revelation. He said put the armor on. Because you're going to have to fight some things in the day you're in. Fight temptation. Find the, cu- the culture that you're in is extremely unfriendly to the things that I'm sharing with you. Love your neighbor as yourself? No, I'd rather fight them and so forth. Le- you know. And then number five, walk properly and put on Christ. Walk properly and put on Christ. Now let me read Ephesians chapter number five. I've already alluded to it, but Ephesians chapter five and we'll close. And verse number 8, and then I'm going to jump to verse 13. But so, so much of what Paul says relative to waking up is, is in this text. He says, he says or, or, or you were once in darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Now, if you want to make a note, just jettison back to chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians. Because we all had our manner of life according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the children of disobedience, and we all had our manner of life according to that spirit. Okay? I was doing my thing. I was doing my own thing. No, it was the devil's thing, the spirit of disobedience, manipulating the whole process of selfishness. Okay? So chapter 2, verse 1. All right, now we're back to chapter 5, verse number 8. There, there, there is, we once walked in darkness, but now are we light in the Lord. Walk as a child of the light. Walk like you know Jesus. Walk like you know something. I don't want to just a little Jesus dabbed on top of me and then live like the devil all week. Come on, somebody. It's like that one guy said, you know, I, I think our church is deacon possessed. Kind of hateful. Okay. All right, jump to verse number 13. He says, But all things that exposed, that are exposed, are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever makes manifest is light. Now, Jesus called you the light of the world, so he's talking about wearing your Christianity again as the armor of light on the outside. Not just theories in here, but practices out here. Not just theories in here, practices out here. In other words, there's an adjustment that needs to be. If, there, if, if the church is at a standstill in, 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 in a place of what's called stasis from a, chance, from a standpoint of growth in America, then something's got to change, and it has to change on us. What needs to be changed in us? You. What needs to be changed in order for that to turn around to experience a great awakening in the United States? He says, therefore... He says, Awake you that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then you walk circumspectly or wisely. In other words, in view of heaven and earth and what God is saying in the moment that you're in, knowing the time that you're in, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
and redeem the time because the days you're in are evil. And then he goes on to say, be not drunk with wine wherein is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song. Get revved up before you have to face anything in the world and then steamroll the devil all day. Amen. Hello? Now, don't miss next week, but here's the point that I want to make. If we're living in the last days, and we are, what is our proper response? I think there are four things, according to what I've been able to share with you so far. Number one, this message is so we can wake up. Well, what's the matter? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You know, I'm, you know who knows when he's coming? It's just a big mystery. It's not a mystery. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached unto every nation. In India, northern India, there's entire groups of Hindu people whose assignment is to kill Christians. That is their assignment. Eliminate anyone who doesn't agree with our religion. Kill them. And they're doing it literally village by village. And so there's a whole group of Christians in northern part of, of India. I heard this testimony just the other day. And they sent out thousands of groups, not just thousands of people, thousands of groups of believers, not pastors, not evangelists, just believers. And they went out and they scattered throughout that same region, knowing that some of them probably wouldn't come back, and shared the gospel. They simply did prayer evangelism and preached in the name of Jesus. And when they prayed, God followed them right into those villages and started doing miracles. Cripples walking, blind eyes seeing, and all of a sudden whole villages coming to Jesus Christ because of the supernatural flow of the Holy Spirit with those who were bold enough to go out and say, I might not live through the experience, but I'm not going to die without telling you about the Son of God. And there's revival. Literally hundred, hundred and, oh, I'm sorry, the number is in the hundreds of thousands. Just a little less than 200,000 people came to Jesus in northern India because of this outreach that they did. Oh, almost 200,000 people. That's like everybody in Dayton, Miami Valley getting saved. Because they just chose to know the time they're in. And at the expense. And see, there's, not, there's so much easy believism in American Christianity that we've lost our missional aspects in the field, the way that, that true Christianity, not, not diluted, messy, philosophical Christianity, which is good for nothing. If God doesn't have enough power to change your life, then who needs it? Just go to the bar and have fun. Eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die this is what I believe at the end of life the big part of life begins and what you do here matters forever why preach the gospel because hell is forever and there's no exit sign on it you can't escape when you go there even if you disagree I'm going to share with you the doorway the pathway not only to an abundant life, redeemed, full of the joy and redemption of God, but forever you will thank your great God for your Savior who saved you from something more dreadful than you can imagine. Why'd he come? You needed him. Say, Pastor, I just didn't want this word today. It's just a little too intense for me. Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Be not unwise. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, and redeem the time, for the days are evil. I didn't write that. But I'll be bold enough to say it, because this culture is waiting for you to show up. Just like they were in northern India, They'll be way more receptive to you here than they were there. How many of you want to see miracles in your lifetime? Here's the word. Get out there where they're necessary. 
because they're not supposed to just all happen at church they happen where they're needed just because we built a dream center doesn't mean we're just all outreach people I don't have to build a center to be an outreach I live this way Jesus saved me and if he did it for me friends if he did it for me a dysfunctional angry young man trying to drown his sorrows in the bottom of a of a bottle lonely every day of my life surrounded by people and alone on the inside and then here comes a shepherd looking for the lost one somebody just like you bold enough to tell me, Pat, you need Jesus. My response was, how come? Once I understood, I said, yeah, I need Jesus really bad. Boy, do I ever need Jesus. Because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if that story is true, that's what I said. If that story is true, it's gonna change my whole life. I can tell you it's true. And it's true for the people that are, got a needle in their arm last night. And it's true for people that are token on a crack pipe. It's true for people that are burning up methamphetamines. It's true for all of them. It's true for people in the ivory towers of this world that think that the accumulation of stuff is, is the dream world only to find out once they get it that it was n- not enough. I thought it would be better than this. How come I'm still messed up? How come I can't keep my marriage right? How come I can't be happy? Why am I so burdened to go make more and more when I don't need any more? Welcome to America. People that have an encounter with God will forever penetrate into the place that has no vision. You think they don't want to hear from you? I guarantee you, a third of everybody that you will see on the sidewalk tomorrow yearns to hear what you know. I guarantee you they yearn to hear it. It just can't be four spiritual laws and some religious cramming down their throat. It just needs to be put on the armor of light and share with every opportunity you can. Just pray with people and watch God show up. Say, Pastor, you're talking a little beyond me right now. No, I'm calling you to your calling. Come and pray. Go to the mountain with God. Have an encounter with Jesus and come out with a new imagination for your own life. That's what happens when you experience God. I think you're the most wonderful people I know. But you're not living in near what God has for you. Can it get better? Lots better. Can my life change? It must change. The time demands it. What's the Holy Spirit saying? What's the Holy Spirit saying? I know the Holy Spirit's speaking all across the room today, and let me just pray for you. There's two different prayers I want to pray for those who need Jesus today. Maybe you've entered into the church today and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, didn't even know you were supposed to ask. Maybe you didn't know that the born-again possibilities, the reset button, the newness of life that's in Jesus Christ, nobody ever even described that to you. I went to church for years and no one told me. Possible that's happened to you. But that's not the way we roll here. I want you to know that you get to walk with the King. What a privilege to walk with King Jesus. By the way, if you want to know what that's like, our King washes feet. That's Him. He made the worlds and He washes feet too. He's amazing. 
Secondly, I want to pray for those whom God is, is calling to a change, to a transformation. The call of the mountain to transformation maybe is today. It's I'm inviting you in to experience something glorious and your response is what's left. Don't build tabernacles. Let's go roll with it. Let's know. Let's listen. Let's yield and obey what God's saying to us. And by the way, don't miss next week. Bow your heads with me. If you're in the room today and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, today can be that day. And so I'm just simply going to ask you today, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today you can. Today you can have your sins forgiven. He's as close as the mention of his name. Matter of fact, I'm going to say this. He set up this day to help you right here. And so if you're in the room today and you say, Pastor Pat, I need Jesus in my life. I know I need Christ. I know I, I, I want to be a Christian. I just don't want to be one of those dried up ones. I want to be a real one. I just want you to know today you can be. He's not asking you to build him a tabernacle. He's asking you to be his tabernacle. And today, you can ask Jesus to be the Lord of who you are. He'll forgive your sin, and he'll give you a brand new beginning. The Holy Spirit will move inside of you and be your tour guide for life. And everything changes when that happens. If you're in the room today, you say, Pastor Pat, I need Jesus to be the Lord of who I am. Please don't leave me out of that prayer. Pray for me. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, lift your hand wherever you are right now. Just lift your hand. I see you all over the room. God bless you. Just leave your hand up just for a moment. Amen. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Amen. Anyone else? Lift up your hand wherever you are. Nine, I see you. God bless you. Thank you. Put your hands down, everybody. Now, everybody look at me here just for a moment. What, can, we, can you join these precious ones that say, I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life? I counted nine folks. Maybe some that didn't, weren't bold enough to raise your hand, but, but today's your day and you know it. I want us all to just lift our voice and pray together. Can we all do that together? And those of you online as well, you can touch that raise the hand button on your screen, on your computer right there, and it just simply says, count me in, Pastor Pat. I need Jesus in my life. It's a step of faith towards the promise of God. And so just touch that button right now. But if that's you, wherever you're at right now, just pray this prayer with me, all of us together. Can we together? Dear God in heaven, I come in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. Thank you for believing in me. I surrender my life to you today. I ask you to be the Lord of who I am. I repent for all my sin. I need a change. And you're it. Thank you, Lord, that you died in my place. You rose from the dead. Come live in me. Say it again, I surrender. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Come on, give me a good amen, somebody. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here at Living Word Church Online. If you made the choice to follow Jesus today, congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. But we don't want you to walk this new path alone. God designed us to be in a community and to help each other. So we want to help you grow in your new faith. Click the raise hand button in your chat box and we'll make sure to help you with your next steps. Or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can text HOPE to the number on your screen. It's God's job to save you, but He's trusted us to help guide you in this brand new faith journey. Here at Living Word, we're all about taking next steps. And whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been following Jesus for a long time, we all have a next step we can take. We want to encourage you to take your next step, no matter what it is. If you'd like to find a group of people to help you grow in your faith, your next step is to join a life group. Life is better when we spend it together. Or maybe you feel like joining our dream team and serving others. Lifetrack would be your next step. Lifetrack is our way to help you find the path from potential to purpose and make a difference in the world around you. Or it could be that your next step is to trust God with your finances. All the ways you can partner with us in growing God's kingdom are on your screens now. All of these next steps and more can be found in our mobile church app. Download it today by texting DLWC app to 77977. We hope you take what God spoke to you today into the coming week and make a difference in your world. We love you, we're for you, and we'll see you next Sunday right here at Church Online.